Today, we've brought together leaders from research, government, and research infrastructure to have a conversation about how these communities can work together to develop improved connectivity options to support research at the North and South Poles. Our speakers are joining us from New York, Virginia, Ottawa, Santiago, and Punta Arenas. I am joining from Canada's capital city, Ottawa, Ontario. Today's event is hosted by Canary, Internet2, and Red Clara, three organizations that enable research and education by operating and evolving national research and education networks. These private ultra high speed networks connect universities, colleges, schools, research instruments and government research labs within each country and then externally to over 100 national research and education networks around the world. And this web of high speed private connectivity enables data intensive, collaborative, cutting edge research that impacts the social and economic well being of all global citizens. We have a full agenda today, but before I begin, I'd like to go through just a few housekeeping details. We're presenting in English and Spanish today, and simultaneous interpretation is available in English, French, Spanish, and Portuguese. You can access this interpretation by clicking on the globe on the lower right hand of your screen and choosing the language of your choice. We're recording today's webinar, and we will have opportunities for questions and answers after each of our speakers. If you'd like to pose a question, please ask it in the Q&A uh, at the bottom of your screen, and I will moderate and get to as many questions as we can. All right, let's begin. The importance of polar research continues to be top of mind, primarily because of the implications for climate change and the models developed that help us understand and prepare for this phenomenon. Funding is flowing to Arctic research. Most recently, the Canadian federal government committed to ongoing funding for the Canadian High Arctic Research Station, or CHARS, in Cambridge Bay. And in the US, donors have uh, provided $41 million for one research project in Alaska, focusing on thawing permafrost. The relevance of polar research has never been greater for all of us. So to kick us off today, I'd like to introduce Dr. David Holland. David is a professor of mathematics and atmospheric ocean science at New York University. David's a physical climate scientist who studies phenomena relating to the polar regions and their impacts on global climate. His current research focuses on computer modeling on the interaction of the Earth's ice sheets and ocean waters. David's also di a director of the Environmental Fluid Dynamics Lab in New York City and director of the level of, of and director of the Center for Sea Level Change at New York University Abu Dhabi. David's made multiple trips to the polls and is here to share some of his findings with us. Please join me in welcoming Dr. David Holland. Hello, and thank you, Catherine. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and to uh, have a chance to meet all you folks. It's amazing how we can virtually travel and do all this um, across all these countries and across all these languages. Um, so am I to share my screen now? Allow Zoom to share your screen. One second, it wants me to allow this. Okay. So Catherine, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, in order for me to share my screen, it said I had to enable it, and then I had to leave the webinar and come back. So this will take about 10 seconds. So I'll have to leave and come back. All right. Sorry for the delay, everyone. One moment.
Okay. Can you see my screen now? Yes, yes. thank you, David. See, that was like really polar research. Nothing quite ever goes right. <laughs> um, okay. So my presentation is focusing really on a singular thing, which is how is it we end up providing policy advice to the world governments about the polar regions? And the way we do that is through doing science with the focus on producing ultimately a forecast. I'm not sure people are aware that we have a forecast currently, like the weather forecast. You can pull up your smartphone and you can see today, tomorrow's weather forecast, which we've developed over the last about seven decades. Getting a forecast of climate and more particularly a forecast of the polar regions of our planet and the fate of ice on the planet is a thousand times more challenging than a weather forecast because you have to get everything about the planet right. And what really brought the weather forecast uh, so far forward was the availability of data at all the airports around the world. Every day, twice a day, weather stations at airports around the world collect data that feed into our weather forecast. And we don't have quite the same thing in the polar regions. We don't have data streaming in from the top and bottom of the earth telling us about what's happening in that system and how it's changing, et cetera. So that to me is why I find this conversation interesting is to share with you what it is that we have as a science objective to produce a forecast for the purpose of policy, but how it is that the, the providing of data from the polar regions is critical to that endeavor. So I as kind of, I'm a math professor here in New York City. I also work in Abu Dhabi. I have a fluid dynamics lab. I run a center for sea level and I'm a part of the American Geophysical Union. In this few, in this uh, time, what I wanna share with you is the idea about what you think is obvious, but is not as obvious as you think. And that is ice is everything about life on earth. Now that might sound like something that somebody who studies ice might say. Uh, I think it's quite the opposite. I study ice because of its property. It's one of the most unique elements in the universe. I think it might be the only one where the solid state is lighter than the liquid. More to our point right now is if you check the media, you see that global sea level is of immediate concern. In fact, I think it's the poster child of climate change. And people think, well, the planet's gonna warm, then the ice is gonna melt. It turns out ultimately <laughs> that is correct. But the way that's going to happen is very intriguing and very non-obvious. And that's why we've been researching the polar regions. Um, in the longer term, the actual survival of life on Earth hangs in the balance to do with ice. And you'll see why that is. There are two molecules that are amazing. Um, no need to go into quantum physics. Basically, these two molecules, water and carbon dioxide, uh, govern water governs life on our planet and CO2 is the entire story about climate change. We need CO2 to have a non-frozen planet. It's a question of how much of it do we need. The greenhouse effect, for those of you know, sunlight hits the earth and it bounces off the earth, but some of the energy is kept back because Greenhouse gas is nothing other than a blanket like you'd put on over yourself in bed at night. It's a blanket and you make it thicker, well, you're warmer and vice versa. We need this blanket. There's a separate effect going on, which is the whiteness of the planet. And from the perspective of the sun, um, the sunlight bounces off white surfaces and reflects back to space. So that's a complete loss of sunlight. The more we lose white surfaces, the more sunlight is trapped onto the earth. So that's the sunlight, so-called shortwave radiation story. As we lose ice, we heat up the planet. The other story before that was the carbon dioxide molecule. The more of that you have, the more you trap of so-called heat infrared. So these two games are playing out, the white ice and the carbon dioxide. And our climate is the balance of those two. There was a time, as you know, not so long ago. 2.4 billion years ago. 
Oh, he's mute the sound. Creeps out the holes. Well, uh, Catherine, can you hear me or the audio plane? Instead of warming the planet. I can hear a bit of both, David. Bit of both. Okay, I'll just turn that down. Temperatures fall. So, creating more ice. So this is interesting how our planet freezes over. It's done so several times. And what happens is when the white ice runs away, then you lose all sunlight heat and the planet becomes a snowball as it was some time ago. It is not ridiculous to think we could end up driving ourselves back into a snowball because we have absolutely no idea what we're doing with the climate system, full stop. And so we're playing a dangerous game but at least but we did come out of this the last time and the last time we evolved that's exactly when life exploded on the earth and appeared um where i grew up in canada so this is my lab one of my labs in the uae and as i travel the world one thing i learned is how small our planet is and the other part is about this place here uh where denise my wife is at the moment um we were traveling along the seashore a little while ago, and we discovered that this very famous place is near us. This is the first life that's ever been recorded on Earth is found in the rocks here on the coast of Newfoundland. These are our first ancestors. Nobody knows if these little scratches are plants or fish, but that's us 560 million years ago. So we've come a long way since the Earth unfroze. The next thing I want to jump to is I think to many people, the idea of a forecast model and a mathematical model and physics, to some people, it's a little putting off, but it's actually very uh, straightforward, to be honest. This is a really simple prototype forecast model, just to give you a sense. And uh, so here is a little computer code, and you look at it. And what we have in our climate centers around the world, in Canada, US, South America, everywhere, we have about a several, about two dozen of these climate models. This is a very simple one here, but it shows you this, the basic properties that govern the most fundamental part of climate, which is one is if we muck around with ice, we're changing the sunlight. And if we muck around with CO2, we're changing the infrared heat. So this model is interesting. And I can just show you. So here, I'm gonna run it just for one second in a, a program. MATLAB, the ones we use for climate are longer. They take you know months to run, but they're no different in principle than this. So here's a little computer code that captures the key equations that we've discovered in the last 100 years about our climate system. And if I run this code, can you see a little icon on my screen, a little figure thing? So. If I just run this, this is a planet simulated with no greenhouse gas. And if I press calculate, our planet would be minus 20 degrees. That's why we've spent so much time in a, in as a snowball. But if I turn on greenhouse gas, as we have today or thereabouts, all of a sudden the planet temperature jumps to 13 degrees centigrade average. And that's what we have today. But that's because our average ice cover on the planet is about 0.32 or the color of whiteness. If I make the planet whiter, like say 75% recalculate, we plunge to minus 60 degrees temperature. So if you decrease the ice, you become radically different. Greenhouse gas is powerful, but ice is way, way more powerful in controlling our climate. So I can put the ice back to where it was at about 0.3, recalculate. And I can change the greenhouse gas down here and I can change the temperature. So there's 21 degrees. If I increase greenhouse gas in this program, you actually have to decrease that number, calculate, and then we become 28 degrees. <coughs> so this program, <clears throat> as simple as it seems, actually captures the essence of our climate. So we shouldn't get lost or confused by climate models, carbon dioxide, keeps us warm, we need it. Ice reflects heat and it's the balance between the two. And we do not have, <clears throat> sad to say, a computer model that can tell us the future of ice on the planet. I think that many people are confused, even scientists, that climate models can do a lot more than they can. 
really, we have only slightly advanced our ocean models and we have not advanced at all our ice models. So our climate models are very incomplete and we're challenged by many things. Communication is data is one thing, but just computation and just basic understanding. So is this all in my imagination or your imagination? Well, no, when I did my PhD in McGill University in the 1990s, not a single planet on this, not a single person on this planet would have said Arctic sea ice will ever change. But I was doing my PhD and it was like, it was a thing that will never ever change. It just grows summer and winter. Within five years after I graduated, nothing to do with me, it started to disappear. And now in summer, half of it's gone. So this is perhaps the largest change that has happened on earth. And in the Arctic, as you know, now the temperatures are rising two or three times faster than anywhere else on the planet. And it's simply because it's changing from white to blue. <clears throat> the Antarctic, just to show how complicated climate is, the Antarctic sea ice really has not been doing the same. So there's a reason for this that's more complicated, but we have to understand that we absolutely do not understand what's happening to ice on this planet. We observe it, we see the Arctic disappearing and the Antarctic growing, but we are not yet at the point where we can provide projections on this. Um, from my point of view, it's a fascinating scientific problem and I love its complexity. From a societal point of view, it's probably something a bit more concerning. Um, my wife and I have spent the last decade or so doing research in Greenland and Antarctica, moving away from the sea ice, moving now to the land ice. The land ice is really the story of uh, global sea level change because sea ice does not change sea level. It's only when ice goes from the land into the ocean. So in Greenland, I'll just show you a little bit of this. So this is where we fly. Part of the reason we like doing research is because the polar regions are just absolutely beautiful. They're a little dangerous, but they are quite remote. And uh, this is where we need data. It's not an understatement to say you are risking your life when you do this. We've lost a handful of colleagues in just the last few years in these environments. Uh, so every time we're out there, um, we are very um, conscious of that. So there's an example of putting some instruments in. This is our field assistant, Brian, a um, very capable person. But at the same time, getting data out of these regions is um, a challenge to anyone. And then getting the data back out from these remote sites is even a bigger challenge. And what's also interesting is how little data we're able to collect, like this one person in that one spot collecting one little element of data. We do collect a lot of data from satellite and remote sensing, but it's insufficient. We need data on the ground, in the ice and under the ice. And that's where the real challenge going forward is. Uh, this is just a slide to say what we learned in decades of research is that ice is not melting from the top but it's melting from the bottom because the ocean is warming. Uh, that took a really long time to learn. And the ocean is warming, not because the ocean is warming, it's because the atmospheric winds are changing. So it's a bit more of a complicated system than you'd immediately might think. The funny thing is in the end, the ice is in fact disappearing. Um, year before last and this year, same as Greenland, I went to Antarctica to the Thwaites Glacier. I don't know if anyone's heard of that. That's arguably the biggest story of sea level change going forward. And it's also remarkable that as we look at it, it's falling apart uh, as we look at it. It's a massive piece of ice. It stretches all the way back to the South Pole of the planet and there's nothing to stop it from collapsing, which is what it seems to be doing now. And again, it's warm water is going underneath it. And a month ago, myself and a pilot from Canada and another researcher made it to Thwaites and we dropped in a temperature probe and confirmed that the water is indeed very warm underneath that, which we had suspected. The Thwaites Glacier seemed like good news. So that's a typical it's field camp, as you can see. Firm. It's a lot of effort to set it up. And they left. The team buried five GPS. 
And what I would say I would stress is, I think people have the impression that the science is moving along really great and fast, but it's not. We're moving along at a snail's pace. We have very little infrastructure in the polar region. We have very little capability to do research, to be honest. We just went with an icebreaker and we couldn't cut to the sea ice or reach the glacier we wanted to reach. Everything possible that could go wrong went wrong and even more than that went wrong. And it's all very normal when you're far away from anywhere and there's no logistical support. Some of the impacts of that research come back to the city like I'm in here now in New York City. I think people, they might be jumping the gun in terms of building barriers and investing in, re in infrastructure, whereas the infrastructure is being invested here, stateside in New York City and elsewhere with the idea that sea level will change, and it probably will. Uh, the investment into getting the answer to the question from the polar regions, what's going on, which includes getting instruments and data out of the polar regions, that investment is very small by comparison. And so it's a bit like the cart is in front of the horse. The problem is being stated, but it's like, well, maybe there's not a problem, but maybe there is. Well, go to the source. And that's where we're coming up short. So um, Denise and I work on delivering this in terms of a computer model. Uh, we work with lots of different countries. Um, there is some increase in investment. For example, South Korea have come along very strong as an international partner and just put a station in Antarctica. So I think leveraging all of these partners, uh, as well as the ones already there, uh, provides for the best foot forward. Um, it's a great place, also the polar regions, to train the next generation. This is a generational problem. This is going to last decades and decades to get our head around this. So getting infrastructure in place now, which is what most what you guys are up to, I think is really worth it, even if it seems like it's going very slow and it takes years to achieve, it's really worth it. Otherwise, we will end up where we are now if we don't make some progress. I think also I think people should appreciate that I think there's Autonomous robots are probably the way to do polar research going forward. Ice breaking ships are a billion dollars or more a pop. They can do very little actually. <laughs> and it's very dangerous to people. And I think autonomy and robots sending data out will ultimately be a valuable way forward. And for the people who do it, it's going to be, I think, uh, economically and or financially incredibly profitable and I think also this is how we will explore beyond the earth will be by robots, not icebreakers. So there are other things happening as Antarctica and Greenland disappear, we will lose places on earth, um, countries, states, but there will be new land. So <laughs> this could be the new vacation spot in a hundred years or so. Um, I'm, I'm finishing up, Denise and I, our center for sea level, we've been at that over a decade now. And uh, so we'll complete this activity and looking for new challenges to work in the polar regions um, with all the experience and lessons learned. And I think over decades, you will see on your smartphone, it's not coming quickly, but the equivalent of a weather forecast. And it will be the result of decades and decades of research. So in conclusion, um, CO2 is important. Um, what it does to ice is far more important. Should CO2 trip off ice, uh, kind of like the day after tomorrow and ice our planet, or in the opposite extreme, get rid of all the ice, we are in for some serious major climate change that will be absolutely epic. And we have no idea about that because we can't forecast ice. It's way way bigger than any nation. So our only hope is still international collaboration. And what we need, I think, is our current paradigm of physics, as I've done it, and people have done it for the last 100 years, um, is not going to get us where we want to get to. We're going to need ways of creating algorithms that can create algorithms. Um, I could explain that later. But right now, our basic approach to climate modeling, I do not believe is going to get us where we want to go. 
And finally, we're going absolutely nowhere without data coming out of the polar regions. No data, no progress, full stop, no way to write a climate model, no way to write an ice forecast. So that is what I think is interesting about this group is the possible contribution. How do you get massive amounts of data streaming out of the polar regions? And that's it. I thank you for your time. Thank you very, very much, David, for that. Um, I'm just checking the, the Q&A. Uh, so uh, from one of our participants, how much data, David, could be gathered and how important would it be to have it available in real time for researchers? Uh, you can still hear me? Yes. So the, yeah, so the, the real time part is very important in terms of forecasting. Uh, for one thing, just forecasting our weather depends on the polar region since the planet's interconnected. So we could greatly improve weather forecasting actually in a place like New York City with more data. And that data would have to stream out real time. It'd have to be available for, for forecast within hours. Likewise, forecasting the global ocean would require such data. And in essence, so there's the, the real time part of it, but there's also the part where there's just the volume of it, where right now we collect data maybe at three or four places in Antarctica every year. There's a few weather stations sprinkled about, but there's nothing in the ocean under Antarctica or around it. And it's really the change of getting data under ice cover into the ocean that's so critical. And that's the part where I think robots and lots of data coming out. But the challenge is, again, you have an ice cover that you have to break through. All right, thank you, David. And and uh, a question from me, if I if I may. Um, we hear a lot about you know the the UN Convention of Climate Science and and you know the ongoing global warming, and they talk about certain consequences of that. But aren't there a whole range of consequences that we can't predict? Uh, absolutely, and the the IPCC models are excellent for what they are. They are our gold standard. <clears throat> they cannot predict ice on the planet. So they cannot tell us that the Arctic sea ice is decreasing and the Antarctic is increasing. Why is that? They can't tell us about how the ocean is changing as the Greenland ice sheet and the Antarctic ice sheet are beginning to fall apart. These are things we're seeing with satellites and now putting boots on the ground. Mm -hmm. So our climate models cannot provide forecast or projection of ice on the planet, which is my main, uh, point to make. Uh, they're excellent for what they are, and they just need a lot more development to become what we want them to be. Well, thank you so much, David. And, and to those who have posed questions, I do apologize. We need to move on, but I want to thank you, David, very much. That is an, an excellent foundation uh, for the continuing conversation. Thank you again. Uh, so I'd now like to introduce Paola Arellano. Paola, Paola is the executive director of Reyuna, the National Research and Education Network in Chile. Paola will be presenting in Spanish, so if you are not a Spanish speaker, please use the interpretation function to listen in in the language of your choice. Bienvenidos, Paola. Muchas gracias, Catherine. Quiero partir. Thank you, Catherine. Let me start by. Uh, thanking Canaries, uh, the Canadian um, Research and uh, Internet to Enrique Clara. I want to thank you all for this invitation and for such an interesting meeting. David's uh, presentation was absolutely excellent. Thank you, David. What you're doing is quite impressive, but it's even more impressive to think of what's still to be done based on what you say. Let me share my screen. Can you see me? Can you see my screen? See, so I'm sharing, right? So let me give you a brief introduction because uh, with me, I have Governor Fleers. So I want uh, to give him the floor after I speak. We are in the southernmost uh, area in the world. So let me tell you about uh, the research and education network in Chile and what we are doing in uh, the southern macro zone. Just to give you an overview, 
very general overview. Chile is the longest uh, country in the planet. Here you see from here down south, and it has access to the Antarctica. It's a country with that is uh, more than 4,400 kilometers long, and it goes from the most arid deserts down to the glaciers and the Antarctica. So uh, it's a true natural laboratory that uh, poses many challenges and many opportunities. It's in that context that uh, RONA, the network, has worked for over 30 years to interconnect the various research centers and universities going from north to south in Chile. And today, our border is uh, much uh, more to the north of the Antarctica. So, and uh, here you have uh, Puerto Montt, and we're, we're working in Patagonia, and it's connecting the uh, southern macro zone to the uh, research and education networks. Here you see an old map of the development of these networks, and you see, although it's rather small, you have this area where there are no research and education networks. Although David said of the huge amount of uh, data that uh, are being produced and uh, need to be to move around. So it's by working together with the Ministry of Sciences and the National Agency for Science. Late last year, we gave the kickoff to the Patagonia project to move forward um, with the network uh, toward the south, thanks to the initiatives by government that have enabled us uh, to um, uh, install uh, new fibers, and the governor will tell you about it. So what does uh, the Patagonia project uh, aim? It's building the digital bridge, uniting all uh, the research and education institutions in the Austrian macro zone in Chile with the country and with the rest of the world. Today's science is global, so it's important not to create any geographic gaps, isolating people, but to enhance development. And certainly, the southern macro zone has huge potentials. We want to strengthen the, the national research and education ecosystem. And as David said, we want to integrate the efforts of the different stakeholders to provide feasibility and uh, sustainability to the project and to promote a better and more science. So if our border today, when we speak of the borders uh, here, look at this, uh, uh, Chile is lying down, although, well, it all depends on how you look at the planet, but we want to extend it to the southernmost um, area in Chile. And of course, we want to get close to Patagonia. And why is it important? Because there's an initiative that is being debated at present in uh, Chile's government, where there are several stakeholders that are working for the development of the country. The deputy uh, ministry and the, the governor will tell us about it. The idea is to go from the Magellan uh, area from uh, Port Williams to Antarctica. Antarctica is the only continent that has no connectivity. You don't have any fibers. Although the data travel through the satellites, given the bulk of the data that is uh, produced, it is essential to provide Antarctica with fiber. So there, um, uh, a call was um, uh, issued to, to see whether there are people interested in uh, uh, conducting a feasibility study to provide the wide continent with uh, fiber. And uh, here, let me very briefly tell you before the governor flees, uh, takes the floor, Magellan is the port of entry. It's the gate to more than uh, 20 countries that have uh, treaties with the Antarctica. So it's the gate to the southern coast. So there's a huge opportunity. There's a huge, huge work that has been done. You're going to listen to the uh, governor to see what has been done so far and uh, the huge potential for the future and what we are planning for future years. So without further ado, I want to thank you again. And I want to give the floor to the governor. And once again, I repeat that we are ready to collaborate and to work um, to 
move forward. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you all. Thank you, Paula. I understand that you have the presentation and that you can share your screen. So first of all, let me start by thanking Catherine and David for his presentation. I'm also going to try to be very brief in Magellan and the Chilean Antarctic region connecting the poles. And as you can see in this map that we present, we usually present the region by turning the planet upside down and from the end of the world, actually, we can be the very top of the world. So you can see that uh, the Magellan uh, region that has the size of Greece, we are 800 kilometers away from the northernmost islands in uh, the Antarctic Peninsula. And today, much of our action, 10% of the regional budget is invested in science. The next slide, please. So Chile has developed a, a policy with an Antarctic uh, statute that is that uh, was renewed in 2020. That uh, Antarctic policy was ratified as a, a statute in 2021 and the Antarctic strategic plan that is currently underway guides us in uh, all uh, the Antarctic logistic and science. The next slide, please. In this Antarctic policy developed by uh, a country in uh, this uh, dynamic situation that we are experiencing both uh, ends of uh, the planet, the uh, Chilean Antarctic uh, policy wants uh, sovereignty, leadership, protection of the environment, research, uh, infrastructure, and this uh, and internationalization. And we have moved forward in science, in transfer, and also we think of a macro zone in the South together with Argentina. And we hope to contribute to the knowledge on climate change with a new production matrix. The next slide. So you see that the interests go beyond the Antarctica the environment uh, in a, a continent of science, peace, cooperation, logistics, and economic activity. You see that Chile is a long strip, as Paola just said very wisely. But from the point of view of the maritime interest and responsibilities uh, for advocacy multiplies uh, the, our land uh, by uh, several figures. Uh, so the territory is hugely important today. Chile projects towards uh, Antarctica, but also toward the Pacific Ocean and also in uh, the environments of um, science, peace and cooperation. And we uh, protect both the legal, the civil and uh, civilian and uh, our armed forces. The next slide. So as Paola just said, the connection and connectivity of the country in a region that was absolutely disconnected with no fiber optic, disconnected from the rest of the world, radically changed in 2018. After the inauguration of this fiber that makes it possible to go from this point where Rona is uh, reaching for over 3000 kilometers to reach a uh, Punta Arenas, where I am now, to the southernmost uh, city in the world, that is Port Williams. And from here, indeed, we are conducting our advanced studies with uh, the telecommunications uh, separate uh, ministry and, uh, to, and to reach Antarctica. And uh, that design study will uh, be, uh, we will call for tenders uh, later this year and we're going to use the national budget. The next slide. So why 
do we want to be connected with the rest of the world? Let me tell you about the infrastructures associated to research projects scientists and researchers that have joined the region. The region today has about uh, 1,000 um, scientists permanently in the region. So this um, is a small population, but in an extreme area. So we have one scientist per uh, 250 uh, uh, people. So it's one of the highest uh, proportions in the world. So the uh, govern uh, the uh, government, uh, local government in Magellan is investing a lot and we are here in the Center for Research and the Teaching of our University, of uh, the Magellan University where we do biomedicine among uh, other sciences with the peculiarities in the area today. We have three national laureates and we have a team working in this center. The next. Our big project in Punta Arenas has to do with the International Antarctic Center. You can see the beauty of these pictures. It's a, it will probably be one of the most representative buildings, not only in the region, but uh, the country as a whole. It's about 40,000 square meters devoted to the subantarctic and antarctic science and as our director of antarctic science has said it's the first antarctic station in the american continent we probably position punta arenas not just as the gateway but also as the antarctic capital in this center we are going to have 22 countries working 22 countries that through mcgillian um, go to antarctica and the idea is that uh, research all year round, and not just in the summer, but all year round, may stay with us. This becomes an enormous cultural space. And this is for the benefit of Antarctica, Chile, and the rest of the world. More than 1 million people are expected to visit us. You can see here some of the areas we're going to recover Antarctic paleontology, aquariums with Antarctic species. Here you see a forest that will recover what existed there when there was a vegetation in Antarctica. And this reflects, and what I wish to reflect here is an enormous iceberg that we'll have here. We hope that the works will begin in January, 2023. There is a mistake here in the slide. We expect to begin in January, 2025, 23, sorry. And we expect to finish by February, 2026. We also finished in the most distant place in the southernmost city of Chile, which is Port Williams. There we finished the sub-Antarctic center. And you see the quality it has. These are the same architects that designed the Clinton Cultural Center in the United States. And it has extension, it includes science, knowledge transfer, and we'll work together with the community as a beacon for Antarctic change and also in the development and technology transfer of the subantarctic area. In addition to that, we have the scientific bases that we are developing. We have three bases, one in the Base Escudero in Carvajal and one in Telcho, which covers the entire Antarctic Peninsula and the western side of the Antarctic Territory. So these are projects that do have been implemented already and two are in the pipeline. With that, we expect to 
comply from the Magallanes region to the Arctic, uh, Antarctic Circle in investigation and probably the largest ever in Chile and particularly for this region. In addition to that, I'd like to mention two projects or rather one project that has to do with a teledetection center. These are polar orbiting satellites. Today there are 600 in 2025, we have 2,400 and they need to download information on atmospheric data, meteorological data, etc. And this will be done for the Magallanes region. These are in progress. This together with the teledetection center and the research center of the University of Magallanes and the Antarctic base have to use the connectivity we have through fiber optics and wish to extend one in Antarctica. I'd like to mention that 60% of the Magallanes territory, 67% is protected territory, 23% mm -hmm. of the sea is a marine park, wish to reach 30%. And let me tell you that we will continue growing in the percentage of protected territories. We want to work on conservation and to have a sustainability and conservation model for the region. We're also cooperating together with Argentina to the marine areas surrounding the American continent. Together with Argentina, the region, we're working with the provinces in the south of Argentina and proposing a very extensive area to protect the Antarctic Peninsula in the coming years. We are working on this, we are conducting discussions, and this together with the Antarctic bases that we have on this island here. At the end of this island, we have our Antarctic bases and we wish to cooperate widely for the marine protection areas. But I would also like to mention that through this connectivity, we have managed to have the longest latitudinal gradient on climate change, this is a sensor covering mm -hmm. about 8,000 kilometers. So the efforts we're making with information for climate change is quite amazing. So science, data consolidation, and digital district. And I almost finished. So it's not only science, but this is also about how we change the energy matrix. Can I have the next slide? As a regional government, we have contributed with the first wind uh, generators. There has been an amazing change in the production, energy production in the region. And with this, I'd like to finish, Catherine, green hydrogen between Argentina and Chile will imply one of the changes that will bring about 10 to 15% change with fossil fuels in the world. Chile and the Magellan area of Chile will contribute to this. So not only in terms of science, but also in transferring science and the contribution with green hydrogen will make us a region that 
will make a contribution to bringing a solution to climate change. The Magellan region wishes to be a region that stands out for the number of scientists it has and for the contribution it makes. Thank you, Jorge. Can we have the last slide to close? So thank you very much. Thank you. And I would like to apologize on behalf of the governor who has to leave. Thank you so much, Paola. Bueno, qué interesante. Southern Chile, so thank you very much. Now, just before we move on to our, our CEO chat, I want to give everyone some context on, you know, David's research. Uh, he does have connectivity at the polls, uh, and I want to give you some context on how that how that works. Uh, for David and researchers like him who are working under uh, funding through the National Sciences Foundation, the National Sciences Foundation in the US has an agreement with a private sector company that operates an array of low earth orbit satellites and they provide data and voice transmissions for uh, you know off the grid regions like the Arctic and the Antarctic, but also for air, sea and rail transportation and and researchers that are using NSF funding to do their research are available to uh, utilize this kind of connectivity. But as we've heard from Paola and Jorge, there may be other opportunities to connect the polls more permanently to the global web of national research and education networks. And arguably, you know, David said we need more data, we need more, we need more immediate data and more scientists and researchers around the world collaborating on that data. So let's investigate those opportunities as we move to our fireside chat with our CEOs. We have uh, Luis Cadenas from Red Clara, uh, the Consortium of Latin American NRENs, Jim Gadben, President and CEO of Canary, the federal partner in Canada's research and education network, and Howard Pfeffer, the President and CEO of Internet to the NREN in the United States. So let's get started. Um, to get us all oriented on initiatives that are currently in flight, I'd like to ask Jim of Canary to talk to us about opportunities to connect Canada's far north. Uh, thank you, thank you, Catherine, and uh, nice to see everyone. Thanks for joining us today, and uh, nice to see you again too, uh, Paola. Uh, it's been some time since we've had an opportunity to meet face to face, and thank you, Governor, for your speech. And, and, you know, the, the discussion about what's happening in uh, Chile with connectivity to Antarctica reminds me of one of the first initiatives I was involved in with, with, at Canary many years ago to, to connect Canada's north. And that was the deployment of fiber along the Mackenzie Valley um, but that went all the way up to uh, Inuvik in the Northwest Territories. And wh why the talk from uh, the, the Chile Chilean uh, NREN sort of reminded me of that from Rauna was that the technology, because of, the, because of the, uh, uh, the tundra, the technology used was undersea fiber optic technology um, because it was virtually impossible to provide power to the uh, amplifier sites um, along the Canadian tundra. Mm -hmm. and, and that is because it's, it's, it's quite a significant challenge. Um, you, if you go onto the Stats Canada website, you'll see that the population density of the three territories in Canada is literally 0.0, .0 people per uh, uh, square kilometer. It gets as high as 80 people per 100 square kilometer in, in the Yukon territory. So, so it, is a, it is a very sparse uh, plan, but there is need to provide connectivity. The second thing that happened within Canary was we were also partnering with the Canadian Space Agency to use uh, the, their satellite technology to provide connectivity. But that was not uh, anywhere near adequate. And you, Catherine, you mentioned the Canadian Higher uh, Research uh, Center. We have also in Cambridge Bay uh, beyond uh, research on the Arctic Ocean, which is critical. Canada is surrounded by uh, oceans on three of its four um, sides. The only place where we have it's our partner to the south. We have a border to the United States. Uh, and so ocean, the ocean research is, is quite important to us, and it was quite eye-opening to hear from Dr. Holland around 
the importance of not just ocean research, but also uh, uh, research on ice. So we are looking at that. Uh, and uh, where we stand now is also, we, we've, we've signed an agreement with uh, Nunavut Arctic College, which, which will connect us up all the way up to uh, uh, Iqaluit, the, the capital of uh, the most recent territory to, to be formed within Canada. And uh, we'll, we'll talk a bit more about uh, those options, but we, we, we really recognize the need of connectivity. Uh, and the last thing I'm gonna say is, is that the Canadian government has made many comments around the need for uh, a sovereign presence in the North and uh, beyond, beyond the usual diplomatic and, and uh, military activities that they would have announced. Clearly having infrastructure that connects the North demonstrates uh, that we have a sovereign claim on the Northern part of uh, North America. So with that, I will uh, pass it on to back to you, Catherine. Thank you. All right, thanks very much, Jim. Uh, so we'll move now. Uh, I have a question for Luis of Red Clara. We heard from Paola about the initiatives uh, the, uh, with Reuna and with the government uh, of Chile about extending the, the fiber optic network into Patagonia. How do you see Red Clara's role in supporting this? Thank you, Catherine, for your question. And thank you to colleagues and friends of Internet2 and Canary for organizing this event. I see a very important role because of the learning that Clara, Red Clara has had uh, collaborating uh, with uh, the connectivity infrastructure. You may have heard uh, of the Bella uh, project. After 10 years, we managed uh, to deploy a new connectivity between Europe and uh, Latin America with a dedicated capacity. Much of that capacity is used uh, for research and education purposes with the collaboration of uh, the digital technology and innovation environments of uh, the two continents. It's been a long experience. Uh, it's a project that uh, actually took 10 years uh, to implement it, but it's been highly successful. And Red Clara, in, uh, under that initiative, we developed the land part of this Bella project, where national research and education networks like Reuna are partners of uh, this uh, initiative and this infrastructure, and they played a key role in, in completing the connectivity of the continent, contributing with their internal, with the uh, domestic connectivity in each country, because the strategy of the project was to make the most and to integrate the connectivity provided by the national uh, research and education networks to extend the connected territories. So that learning, in my view, it's important to make it available, to offer it uh, so that we can all connect uh, the Antarctica. Based on what uh, David just told us, the importance of uh, the Antarctica for climate change and the relevance that it has for the education community globally is uh, of huge importance. I think that Red Clara, Reuda, and the global uh, research and education networks guarantee neutrality and an approach for data management that uh, aims uh, to facilitate uh, the accessibility and interoperability of data and replicability of data. Mm -hmm. So this, um, and that is extremely important to be able to ensure the access to the information. We are working closely with Reuna. We want to also work to, to work jointly with the government of Magallanes and the uh, um, ministries in Chile to provide direct connectivity from Chile to Antarctica for the benefit of mankind. We want the data to be uh, available to all so we can protect our planet. And I think it's a contribution that we'd like to offer to the rest of the network community and the global research community. Okay, 
perhaps many on the uh, the call aren't aware of that that national research and education networks are not for profit organizations and there is a culture of collaboration and shared learning that amplifies and accelerates our our advancements i've i've seen this uh over the course of my career with canary and this is a, an important element of how we move forward thank you uh, i have a question for howard pfeffer at internet to howard how does Internet 2 view polar connectivity and the role of the NREN? That's very great. Uh, thanks. Uh, and again, always a pleasure to uh, share a panel with my with my friends and esteemed uh, colleagues, uh, Luis and uh, and Jim, and uh, all the folks and, and, and uh, um, other presenters today. Uh, so I'll, I'll answer this question from the perspective of uh, probably the most recent uh, uh, opportunity uh, we've had to to participate in some discussions around uh, connectivity in Antarctica. And, and, and the last year, the National Science Foundation held a, a workshop uh, around an Antarctic uh, subsea cable, um, and it was focused on high-speed connectivity needs uh, to advance U.S. Uh, Antarctic science. And, and the goal was to produce a report that outlined uh, the, the science advances and impacts that would be enabled by a massive improvement in digital um, connectivity in Antarctica. And you can use your favorite search engine to find the, the report on, online if, you're, if, if you would like to read it. Um, and, and the core interest uh, or the focus area was around understanding the value of a, a submarine fiber optic cable that would go from from New Zealand to McMurdo Station, the, the core Antarctic base for the, for the US. And I'll, I'll briefly summarize the findings uh, from the report. Uh, so the first finding was clearly, uh, you know, existing and future Antarctic research would significantly be enhanced by um, removing the bandwidth limitations that exist uh, today and in in, in, in through the use of a fiber optic cable to connect Antarctica. Um, Additionally, that the new cable could be constructed uh, with embedded instruments. I think this is mm -hmm. generally known as a smart cable or scientific monitoring and reliable telecommunications cable that would provide itself a, as a platform for, for new research and understanding of the Southern Ocean and Antarctica. Uh, the, the other the third finding was the robust bandwidth uh, for uh, beyond the, the needs of just the, the movement of the huge amounts of scientific data that would be um, that's collected today and in the future, uh, and we come from things like a smart cable itself, mm -hmm. is there's also a need for interpersonal connectivity uh, for the people, the, the, the researchers and, and staff and operations people in Antarctica, um, the ability to do remote education. You could imagine wanting to have students all over the world be able to have real time mm -hmm. video and, and all kinds of immersive activities coming from, from the continent. Uh, so education and as well as overall community well-being and uh that um the construction of a cable to antarctica in mcmurdo um would also uh support and, and could be extended as a platform to support the the, the field research uh in the south pole uh, but as long as even in, in all parts of the continent um and and it would be a key element of, of providing that so, you know, as, as always, I think one of the roles of the NRANS is to participate in these types of workshops and to provide input. We have provided input uh, on everything from, you know, ownership models to, mm -hmm. to, you know, to network use cases. But I think the one of the big areas that NRAN specifically um, can do is look at how would such a system uh, or a system of cables be integrated into the global uh, RNE network uh, mm -hmm. uh, ecosystem. And if you really think about it, to take advantage of capacity in that link to the continent um, and all those different types of traffic, not just large bulk transfers on a periodic basis, but real time communications, access to cloud services, which are it's like Zoom, for instance, which are mm -hmm. be used by people in Antarctica. Um, how do you engineer across the global RE network infrastructure the right network connectivity, the capacity, and all the other capabilities necessary to make it available to all the researchers in the world? And I think that's an area that's one of the, um, the huge uh, advantages of the NRAN community is our collaborations. We do this in, in other 
areas. For instance, the Large Hadron Collider open network environment is a clear example of when the community has come together to provide that connectivity. And so, you know, I think beyond participating in the activities of specific cables and providing input um, uh, or more direct involvement, depending on where you are, uh, this thinking as how do we connect uh, the, with new connectivity be available to uh, the, the global NRAN infrastructure is, is a critical role for NRAN. Thank you so much, Howard. That's, uh, so there are initiatives kind of happening, you know, NSF, what's happening with Reuna and the, uh, and the Chilean government, what's happening in, in Northern Canada. Um, Jim, I'd like to circle back to you. What do you see as the most promising opportunity or set of opportunities to extend the global research and education network to the polls? So, so I, I, you know, I'll build on, I'll build on, uh, how Howard's comments. Um, you know, one of the things that he probably went through, which I went through coming from the private sector is this, this, this total shock of, of actually showing up in a fully collaborative uh, community where nobody really competes with anybody outside your country. Um, and, and that provides like a scaffolding of a collaboration sort of second to none uh, around the world. In that uh, we can we can pool our talent, we can pool our resources to address some of these global challenges. I mean, a good example that uh, um, is the uh, a number of years back, the across the North Atlantic, you know, five organizations kicked off uh, an initiative called the uh, ANA, the Advanced North Atlantic Agreement, which allowed us to pool our funding to, to give everybody more capacity across the North Atlantic higher availability, so more a more reliable um, connectivity and cheaper for everybody than, than the prior solutions. So we are pursuing uh, pooling uh, our, our resources in the in the ocean perspective, but we're also going to look at that in, in things like uh, LEOs, uh, but uh, and new fiber initiatives that are being discussed. We know that there are constant uh, fiber proposals being uh, contemplated to connect Europe to uh, uh, Asia via the Northwest Passage, which, which will you know, come very close to the poles. We will capitalize on the work that uh, Rayuna is doing and build that as a model for uh, ongoing uh, polar connectivity, where, where the collective uh, interests of the global research community are being met by what you referenced as the GRAN. And so this, the, the, the collaborative ethos in this sector uh, allows us to find innovative solutions that uh, leverage the, the scarce resource we have called money to give us the best connectivity, the best connectivity options around the world. So I think that's, uh, I'll give you more of a business answer than a technical answer. Right, thanks, Jim, appreciate that. Um, turning to Luis now, uh, Luis, what do you see as the challenges in moving polar connectivity initiatives forward? Gracias. Thank you, Catherine. I think that the most complex issue and the most difficult thing to achieve is to reach an agreement between the different corporation stakeholders globally to achieve that end. I think that this is something that should trigger a collective effort by all the potential sources of contribution for the funding of uh, these projects. We just heard the governor saying about talking about the will of the Magellan government to promote this connectivity model. I think that we should develop a model similar to that of Bella. But the difference is that the Antarctica cable, all the traffic is for scientific purposes. In the case of the connectivity between Europe and Latin America, that's only part of it. But it, with Antarctica, all the connectivity, all the data, are for the sake of research and to find solutions uh, about climate change, among others. I think that that collaboration is absolutely relevant. We have been moving forward to connect, uh, to better connect uh, all uh, Latin America in subsequent phases of the Bella project. And I think that it is possible to engage, for instance, Europe through the European Commission to involve them 
in uh, the feasibility project uh, for the Antarctica, so that in the future they may also contribute with resources for this initiative. The national research and education networks in uh, Latin America are also uh, ready to collaborate, to support and improve these capacities. And we are the gateway to this big global community that lends us this capability to work collectively in terms of data, connectivity, and computing services, and other tools that are absolutely essential for today's science. And I think that it is very important to consider the element that was already mentioned by the previous speakers, that is, the condition of non the non-profit condition of uh, these our networks that is uh, we they are oriented to, to produce benefit for mankind without seeking for economic uh, profit of course there may be interest in getting money in all activities but we working for the connectivity of the poles it is essential to be neutral enough and to ensure that neutrality for all those that need data from the Antarctica. I'm going to uh, give the last question to Howard at Internet2. Howard, what role would or could NRENS play with respect to LEO low Earth orbit satellites and polar connectivity? Great, great question. So, uh, if we assume that you know, cables will, fiber optic subsea cables uh, from one or multiple places will actually connect to Antarctica, it's a challenge, but it seems feasible, but certainly has its challenges. Um, you still have an issue of the intracontinental uh, connectivity. Many of the experiments run at the South Pole or all over the continent, at, uh, and um, you know that's a, in and of itself an equally challenging problem. You know. People have explored, you know, hardened, uh, armored, you know, cables on the surface and all mm -hmm. kinds of, you know, um, wireless technologies. Um, but but one of the advantages of actually getting cables to the, to the continent is that those those locations could then become uh, downlink uh, or ground stations for for satellites and mm -hmm. and therefore um, greatly. Uh, improve the capacity and and the, and the latency for using satellite connectivity to get uh, through the rest of Antarctica, um, and so it'll like be a combination uh, of 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 a, of a system like that. And latency is also going to be critically important, as I think the first speaker talked about robotics and all kinds of you know capabilities that you want in, a, in when, once you have a rich rich connectivity. Um, so. You know, as far as NRANs go, I think Jim mentioned this, you know, um, again, you know, if, if there are, you know, it's still emerging, you know, these, these, there are many, there are, you know, multiple commercial operators that are beginning to deploy LEO satellites uh, and, you know, when they uh, have polar connectivity at the appropriate level, you know, I think it's still, it's still emerging, but, but certainly one of the things that we do is Collect, number one, collectively provide a voice for the RE community and specific requirements for the RE community. And if there are opportunities where uh, we could act, uh, at, you know, consortially to, 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 to make, to, to create a, a, a better environment for our members, um, that's the level of collaboration that, that we do. So I expect that that would continue in this area as well. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Howard. I'm afraid we've uh, run out of time today. Um, but it strikes me that there's tremendous momentum in several areas around trying to uh, develop better connectivity to the poles and the role of, of the NRAN partners around the world seems to be foundational to that. So I'd like to thank all of our speakers, David, Paola, Jorge, Luis, Jim and Howard for joining us today. And of course, all of you participating in, and engaging in this conversation. If any of you want to learn more um, about NRENS or understand these initiatives going forward, I encourage you uh, to go to the websites of Canary, Internet2, Red Clara, sign up uh, for our email and news distributions. Because of the communities we serve in research and 
education and innovation, there is always something interesting happening at the NREN. So with that, we'll conclude today's Connecting the Poles webinar. I want to thank you all for participating and wish you a wonderful afternoon.